My name is Darnell Williams, and I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Urban League. Of and I am very humbled to be here with Abu Hanif to talk about his life experiences here in Boston, to give you, the listening audience, a sense of where he's traveled, places he's been, people he's met, family uh, connections, etc., giving us an overview of what the contributions that his family and he have made here in the city of Boston. And it's in that deep sense of humility that we want to have a conversation, a conversation about what Boston has meant to you and what you mean to Boston. So really kind of just tell us what your full name, Abu Hanif Abdul Hala, mm -hmm. means. Uh, well, what it means, uh, my dad uh, selected uh, my name. We had gone through the transition of recapturing our identity and then part of that was the name and each one of us, um, my brothers especially, uh, he gave a name. And me being the oldest, the oldest of ten, I was Abu, which was a signal that um, I had certain responsibilities within the family and the family structures. Um, and I became Abu. Abu is father. Mm -hmm. uh, it has religious connotations. Anytime you see a name Abdal, Abdullah, Abdul, um, it is very similar to a Christian who is named Joseph or Mary in terms of the female. Uh, and it means that, and usually when you see that Abdal, Abdul, Abdallah, mm -hmm. it follows with something else, one of the attributes of uh, Allah God. And uh, basically, my name is Abu uh, Hanif. Hanif means one who seeks purity. Abdal, Abdal is one who submits to the will of the King God. That's very, and most of us in Boston, we just call you Abu and did I, not know the significance. Was, <laughs> a saying dad, uh, <laughs> pop is a warmth anyway, and so, yes. Yeah, where where were you born? I was born in uh, Houston, uh, Texas. Okay. Houston, Texas. So how did your family get from Houston to Boston? Well, uh, my father uh, had some friends who left Texas and came to uh, New York and different places in the North. And he had heard different things about the North. And, and what was your father's name? My father's name was Malik. Malik. Okay. Um, and he had heard about uh, Boston, and one of his closest friends came here who had worked on the railroad, and my father sort of came behind him. Like and brought his what family. time? This was when I came here, this was in 1944. Okay, okay. That that occurred. Right around and World War II, uh, right up in that. Right period. just before the end of the Second World War. Okay. And that uh, we arrived in Boston. and. Uh, we moved in the Roxbury area, up on the corner of Humboldt and Townsend. Okay, is that uh, kind of known as Sugar Hill? Is that the well, kind it was of area? known as the Hill. We the didn't hill? like those who lived there. Didn't <laughs> like it to be known as the Sugar Hill because we were kind of like struggling people, and so okay. on. the culture was um, a little different, especially for us coming uh, from the south, and so on. Okay, okay. Tell us if you will, qualities that, about your father that maybe uh, are resonating with you that have guided and nurtured you during these years? Uh, my father was unique. My father didn't think in the box. He thought outside the box. He was very committed to um, um, the most important thing that a person can give is that word and that you maintain that. Uh, my father was a small man. My father didn't weigh 125 pounds at any point of his life. Um, he was, was ill and um, he had bad hips, he could hardly walk. Mm -hmm. And as a result of the pain that he would endure over time, he became hunched back because he used to bend to favor the hip. Question, you were telling us about your father and Malik, mm -hmm. and, um, and you were really describing what he instilled in you is that the most important thing is your word. 
So share with us the, those insights, because you're the oldest of 10. Now, did all of your siblings kind of gravitate to that same kind of persona around your father's qualities? Yes, but in, in different ways, see, because I can't really talk about my father without speaking about my mom. She's, I got questions for you about and, your mom. And, and so, so my father kind of leaned towards bringing up the, the, the boys. Okay. And there okay. was four of us. Okay. And my mother leaned towards the girls and there was six of them. Okay. And my father was a Muslim, but my father never kind of practiced openly his religion. My father was very much for his people. Okay. And my mother was a devout Catholic. And so when they got married, uh, my father made a vow that he would not try to persuade his children that they would all be Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so we were primarily raised as Catholics. And when I became an adult, uh, and when I went into the military, I was exposed to Islam for the first time. What branch? I was in the Air Force, and they had shipped us to North Africa, and I was in a special unit, an OSI, Officer Special Investigation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And prior to going there, we had been indoctrinated, had gone for this special training in New York City. And um, when I went over to North Africa, I did not want to go because my image of African people was that of what I had been taught in school. And what my father had told me it really didn't register because like many of us growing up and listening or not listening to the parents, they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I was very embarrassed and afraid. And uh, while I was over there, some things occurred uh, which made me to look in a more objective way of the people. Did it open up your eyes? In uh, tremendously so. Tremendously so in, in terms of the fact that there was another religion other than Christianity mm -hmm. and what it meant to other people. And when I saw them and the way that they lived, um, um, it impressed it, you in a way that it's not imagine. something. Uh, it it it's, it uh, impressed me the way that uh, Mr. O, uh, Barack Obama impresses me. It's something that I felt. Okay. Okay. And uh, you know, it's something that that comes with. It's not something that someone else can come along and tell you about. But it was a feeling in which you got as a result of being in the setting and being in that setting for. X period of time. At first, I was really. It must have been you know, culture shock for you. It, it 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 was. I began to realize upon landing in Morocco, where I was in in, in uh, Casablanca, mm -hmm. in one eye, I saw Cadillacs of that day and time. In the other eye, I saw the way that people were living, uh, in the same way that. I understood Jesus Christ lived the way that simple he dressed lifestyles. and so on. A very simple but a very respectful one. And after being there for about uh, two months and so on, I began to realize that only time I saw uh, arguments and uh, people that might have been intoxicated and that kind of stuff that was people from here, outside. from America, from outside. right, and not the people that lived there. And I began to um, interact with the people there. That's when I began to learn about Islam. You mentioned that your mother nurtured the girls and your father nurtured the boys. Yes. So share with us then perhaps the, the qualities that your mother um, imparted on the girls, but I'm sure it did not fall to deaf ears on the boys, because I think it's a combination is what you were sharing with us initially? Well, I think that they were singing out the same hymn, hymn book. It was just different strategies. Mm -hmm. And also with that, it was different exposures. Um, um, back in the day, uh, none of my brothers, as an example, no, I learned how to cook. And okay. We didn't necessarily have to do the dishes. Mm -hmm. And my sisters did that. In turn, 
we had to take out the garbage. And if there was any repairs to be done in the house and stuff like that, mm -hmm. we were the ones that had to do that. So it was a separation of us. And each one of us knew that we had certain responsibilities, you know, to, to, to take care of as a male and as a female. And that was our basic way. But it wasn't my mom and dad telling us, well, because you're a boy, because you're a girl. In retrospect, I can take and go back and look at that to see just in terms of how they work that. And as a result of that, which my mom and dad, and my mom is still living, 93 years old. Oh, uh, that's, now, that's a blessing. Um, uh, uh, I have sisters that are uh, uh, lawyers, I have brothers that are businessmen in the community, I have uh, others that are uh, in the yards, then I have uh, uh, nieces and nephews that are uh, educators, it's about, we have about 10 including two of my own children. Uh, and there's another eight, maybe nine, in the uh, Boston public school systems as school teachers. It sounds such a such a rich. I mean, we can go in so many different directions. Right. But spend a few minutes talking about the other nine. You, you said you had six sisters and three brothers. Right. And are they still here in the Boston area? Or? All of us are here except two of us. Okay. Uh, one is in Florida and one is in Atlanta, Georgia. So all of, all of you, all of your siblings are still alive yes. and with you. We all are alive and all vintage like me, <laughs> uh, uh, and and healthy and, and functional. That's a that's a tremendous blessing. Yes. I had ten folks in my family too. Ah, so, so the senior lives. Where did so, you sit in line? I'm somewhere about number six or seven. So you, you, I was never right. old enough that's to be That's why you spoiled. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we kind of didn't like the person who was the oldest because they were in charge. Yeah. yeah. Well, my, the relationship even today with my sisters and brothers, uh, uh, um, they, uh, they respect me. I often tell the story, <clears throat> my mother only, my mother and dad had only, uh, had 10 children mm -hmm. because they were trying so hard to duplicate me being the first. <laughs> and so that's how that happened. But my sisters and brothers, even today, uh, they have a respect for what I may say and, you know, may ask or seek my input sometimes when some, there's some issues or some... some That's something that you can't on. buy when yeah. you have brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews looking for the yeah. sage wisdom and insight. Yeah. How did you, your mother and father discipline you when you were growing up? Or not just well, you, but well, your... My father whipped my butt. <laughs> okay. and, I, and I appreciate the fact that he did. Okay. <clears throat> and it was deserving. And he used to use the strap uh, okay. you know, to do so. And I didn't understand it or like it in that sense, but I needed to be disciplined because I was just a boy that was growing up. I didn't have things in which um, I wanted to have, and so I sometimes reacted. I didn't always behave in school. I wasn't a scholar. I wasn't a good student. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would act up, and if I had something to say, I would say it, and I didn't have disciplines. Um, and my father handled us in each way he saw that we needed help, we needed uh, a big way to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had my strengths and my need areas, and they were different than what my brothers were. And I had my attributes as well. So my mom and dad, both of them recognized that and accordingly made the adjustment Just, so that, yes. You mentioned that it sounds like it was a very tight family structure where there's reinforcement and love and guidance, also freedom. So then if you look at that, and, and it's a tremendous blessing to have all of you, but why don't you give the listening audience a sense of the accomplishments that your family have made here in Boston from your perspective? Um, well, the accomplishments have been, you know, if I would look at that is, I don't know, that's difficult because we don't feel that we have accomplished. I mean, we don't well, feel that we Well, how about contributions? Have, the contributions, um, we don't feel that we have given enough. I mean, we have given materially when we could, uh, through a business that we have started, we contributed significantly to the community in different ways. 
And I think that what drives not only my sisters and brothers today, and they're going through the agony because they're in part in business and they're in part um, trying to sustain in these challenging times, especially today, mm -hmm. is that they feel frustrated that they have not been able to, you know, do do enough. Let me let me ask the question another way. If you had to think about your family legacy, and if you had to write a one page or a, a couple of words to describe that commitment to the people. I think you said your father was yeah. committed to the people. Yeah. And your brothers and sisters have chosen professions that are serving people. So there is a life legacy of serving. So when you look at that servanthood, then how do you capture the essence of that? Because not everybody, doesn't, everybody doesn't get it. Most people bite the apple. You guys plant seeds. Right, and, and, and I guess to say in the sense of the hidden thing, I have it, my brother next to me, all of us do, we stay in the background. We never come out in front. It, there's some things in which we can do in the background, you know. To move the agenda forward? To move the, whatever that is. Okay. And, and, and so we like to stay on the front lines, but we like to stay in the backgrounds of the front front lines. And where does that come from? That comes from basically uh, my dad. I've seen my dad work. I, and I didn't really realize the magnitude, you know, of what my father has done over the years with such a diverse group of people. And when I say diverse, mm -hmm. it was primarily and focused in terms of the of the people, the immediate community, and if it went beyond the community, uh, there's so many things that I could share with, with, you know, the things that he done along that. Uh, but but if you were to give someone just some a sampling of the kinds of things that your dad did uh, behind the scenes, if that's possible, or you know, because you know what what's really going on from my perspective is that there's such a spirit of humility and modesty, that's what makes you guys great. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm humble. But I think that in order for people to really understand and have a better sense of that contributions that you're, you, your family, and your father have made, just if you can, if you can pull out maybe one or two examples of what that means of being behind the scenes, not competing to be in the point, but completing the issue that needed to get done, if you can. The most interesting times of all was during the 60s, the transition, when we came from being colored and Negro mm -hmm. to just using the word uh, mm -hmm. black. Um, that was very, very challenging. It was very, yeah, it was Herculean. I thought it was just a very Herculean task. I'm, I, I look back and I'm awed at that because at one time, if you call me black, we have a very serious oh, very much so. fight, and to get us, a, you know, a, a, away from that. Now, uh, and my father was a proponent of that, and proponent of being general, called black. Of with, well, oh, yes, well, was, progression. Was progression, yes. I mean, uh, not an opponent, but you know, he was, you know, he was about that. He was about in terms of the movement, but yet we didn't per se, join any organization. My father never joined in the NAACP, the Urban League, uh, uh, New England's grassroots organization, you name them, he just didn't join in. I mean, basically the reason why is he, if he was going to join, he would commit himself to that particular group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he, he just wouldn't do that because he didn't want to spread himself too thin, and he wanted to put himself in a position to support them all. Okay. Because okay. He, he didn't agree with everything in terms of the NAACP, mm -hmm. but he knew what the NAACP was doing, and therefore he supported in other, in other ways. And so where he sat, um, we, we sat in the heart of the community, in the heart of the community, what I mean is that we sat in the barber shop. I, I, I remember the time... Was it a family barber shop? 
Uh, my father owned it. Okay. And okay. I cut okay. hair in there. Okay. I didn't cut hair. He would beat me up if I said <laughs> I cut hair. I was a hairstylist in there. Okay. My brother was a hairstylist in there. And um, it was one of the most vibrant barbershops here in the city of Boston. Um, during this transition period? During the, at this vital time, the transition period. My father started at the barbershop when he first came to Texas. As a matter of fact, when my father came from Texas, uh, my father bought property here. He first came and he bought a place for us to stay before we even came here. And we had property in Texas. But he got rid of that because he wanted his his kids, and it was four of us at the time, wanted his kids to have a different exposure than what it was in Texas. In Texas? And even though it was good and we lived a good life, as a matter of fact, when we left Texas and we came here, we suffered, really, because one, my father took ill, two, the culture was just totally very different because we had lived, yes, in Texas, we had lived around. What part of Texas? In Houston. Okay, okay. And, um, you know, I could, I remember as a kid, fondly so, after school, and I'm walking down the street, and a teacher would stick her head out of the door and say, I, then my name was Reginald. Reginald, Reginald, will you run to the store for me? And I would be very proud. When I came up there, that didn't happen. All the teachers looked different, and I, I really didn't like them mm -hmm. because they just seemed so distant and foreign to me. And I began to academically, I began to decline. I rebelled. I didn't know why I was doing this, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. I was. That's why that was my action. So it was really a big shock for us. But my dad wanted us to be exposed to school and all of that kind of uh, nice things, and he had heard things that were better than all. And not only the climate and the snow and all of that kind of stuff that we had to adjust to. Uh, but my father became uh, very much involved in, in, and as, as a result of being at the barber shop. It started out on Mass and Columbus Avenue. It was the Hi Hat then. I used to see my That was the name King. of it, the Hi Hat? No, oh. the Hi Hat was a nightclub. It was oh. a famous nightclub on, right on the corner of Mass and Columbus Avenue. Okay, okay. And that's where everyone. And so on the same gravity. side as Wally's or on the other side? It was on the other. Where Wally's is now, right? that's where my father's barbershop was, oh, 327A okay. yeah. Mass Avenue. Oh my yeah. goodness, okay. And, I, um, and uh, what was the name right across it, what the name of what my was dad's name barbershop? barbershop? Bo Nubian Barmel. Wait, so down. And Bo Nubian Barmel is the name <laughs> of a group of guys okay. that um, when he was going to school in Texas, and they were group and they hung out together and they used to call themselves the Bro Bummers. Okay, okay. And uh, then when my dad came to Boston, he opened up his shop. He, he named it Bro Nubian Brummel. Bro Nubian Brummel. Bro Nubian Brummel. Okay. Now at that time, Malcolm used to be there pimping. Um, Martin Luther King used to be on the corner of Mass and Columbus Avenue. I've seen him there. I've seen John F. Kennedy. Uh, on Mass and Columbus Avenue back in the day. Okay. Uh, because my dad, at about 10 years old, used to have me and my brother in a barber shop. Because at one point, when you used to um, get your hair cut, after you get your hair cut, or while you're getting your hair cut, someone would come and brush off right. your shoes <laughs> and shine them, and then the whisper them, and that's what we used to do. And so that means you to sweep up the hair. And sweep up the yeah. hair and keep the barber shop clean and stuff. And we'd make a little, you know, a guy would tip us and so on after us, and we'd make a little money. But also outside, outside the activities in terms of the barber shop, and you had uh, the, the guys who were former, I don't want to say the names, but they were former um, um, red caps working the railroad. They started booking numbers, and they would come into the barber shop to get their services and so on. And an array of people, the doctors and so on, the musicians, they had the musician all right down the street. And so we were fortunate, uh, you know, that we had all of those exposures. So you those had a range of personalities yes. to come to there. Yes. Uh, we, would, we would know, coming up, even from Gary, Indiana, that you know when life was good when somebody hit in the family because you ate pretty good when the number came in or right. boy go get my my dream book right right 
those are the, I mean, but there was a range of the, 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 the customers that came in. I had to just give you a body of knowledge about people. Well, it's like I said, me standing behind a barbershop, I define that as the best position that I ever had. Okay. It is the best, and I call it a position because it was that. Um, and uh, I learned a lot being there. I learned a lot shining shoes there. I learned a lot brushing customers off there. And I learned a lot of stuff. Now, what did you learn? I mean, as for example, when you say you learned a lot, but then tell or you know share with us uh, 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 life uh, lessons or things that you may have learned. Then uh, it's it's like. Let me try to define it this way. One minute I'm talking with a doctor, mm -hmm. and the next minute I'm talking to someone that's homeless. And it requires two different types of conversations. And your purpose as a stylist is to make a person feel better. Not only look better, but feel better. And if they feel better, they look better. Okay. And that's your job. And your concern about putting food on the table. And so you're compelled to do that. And the more you can make people feel better, the more they're gonna come back to you. So the repeat customer is something that you That's want. correct, that's a signature. Okay. You know, my dad used to say, it's not really important, you may want them to come back because you do it, they are very good. And that's, that's excellent, but uh, it's not really, really important in comparison to the individual coming back. And it takes a variety of things to make that person feel better. And that means also back. word of mouth. Word of mouth is the best advertising that you can have. Mm -hmm. If my friend, uh, one of the guys we mentioned, Bootsy, came up to me and says, oh wow, Darnell mm -hmm. is such a nice person. That's more than if I read about something about you in the newspaper, and will supersede if there was something negative about you, because my friend said something about you, weighs more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if he's complimentary, it weighs more than what all the negative stuff that you might hear about that person. That word of mouth is very important. And Keen, you mentioned the transition in the 60s as being probably one of the most rewarding times in history. Interesting times. Now, early in 60s or late 60s? Uh, the beginning of the 60s, that's when I saw, you know, the, the movement change in 59. Uh, well, now, when and then you say in movement, 60s, what, which movement? Movement the, of us, and, you know. In as a people? Of, as a people. When we began to move, the hope was always there. You know, was, you know, Sundays we had to dress a certain way. There was a lot of, in terms of us going to church and the women wearing their hats and all of that. It's always that pride and that dignity. But it wasn't in the sense of that same rhythm and momentum that existed in the 60s when, when the H. Rap Browns and the Huey P. Newtons and the Stokely, Stokely Carmichaels Michael. and the Martin Luther Kings and the Malcolm X, when they came along. It changed, what it changed a transition that. from from the way we looked at ourselves in the mirror and, 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 and to better understand. <clears throat> and, and the whole thing was to be able to identify and to link with, with uh, our, our motherland. Uh, that's how Nubian Ocean started. Ahmad Jamal, the pianist, he, okay. he was the one. He used to put out uh, cards, he had artists to, mm -hmm. uh, they were kind of like holiday cards, Christmas cards, and they were of uh, African people and of Arabs and their native dress and so on. And they were very nice and we started selling them. And then I had gone to Africa, I had gone to Morocco and had made some contact there and and, and, and basically, we started carrying some of those items in the barber shop. Uh, we started shipping in some stuff. So you're saying that the Nubian notion was born uh, out of the concept of these artist renditions and the contacts you made when you were in Morocco. So that means you served uh, in the Air Force during the, the Vietnam conflict or Korea? Do, during the Korean conflict. The Korean conflict. The Korean conflict. Okay, okay. And uh, I had gone overseas. And uh, as a result of going overseas, um, a lot of things happened. 
I was really exposed. And at the same time, my dad got really involved with, um, uh, what can I say, the, the, the Nation of Islam. Okay. Uh, he got involved in the sense he wasn't involved in terms of joining, but the teachings that they, they had at that time. And he would also articulate that in a lot of those who were trying to find themselves because it was very few then. Mm -hmm. I remember the brothers used to come up and they would see each other and they would say, I I I <laughs> wouldn't even know what to what say. That's okay. how far removed we were from, you know, a part of our history mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so um, and they gravitated uh, uh, around the barber shop and then that brought I remember in Nubian Notions we used to um, sit down in there and we had these camel saddles and I was basically operating Nubian Notions then. Most people might not know what Nubian Notion is so you might want to just give them a uh, brief oh, summary of what uh, Nubian Notion is, if you can. Nubian Notion was, as opposed to what it is, Nubian Notions has lost some of its flavor. My brother's going to beat me up for this, but... Well, um, well, then don't have him beat you up. No, Just tell I don't us mind what, what was the concept behind it? It was a concept of a place where it was an opportunity for people to link on to their identity. Okay. And like my Jamal's in terms of the regular white Christmas cards. See, because back in that day, we were talking about little black babies should have black dolls. That's right. And nobody was bringing Ken we and Barbie was that. not, we didn't have any other dolls other than Ken Correct. and Barbie. Correct. And so, so uh, it was a time for somebody to come up with black dolls. We couldn't do that. We didn't have any, any skills in, you know, making dolls and that kind of stuff. But we could come across in terms of some items and people wanted some tangible things to link with this new identity that everyone was feeling. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we kind of brought the uh, pick, the thing to pick the oh, head yeah. with. The yeah, the, we had the, the red, the green, and the black. No, oh, that was the, before then. This is the, the this one was that was made out of the bone? The, the, no, 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 no. This was the steel one? Then. Well, the bone ones, yeah, that was, and they were <laughs> too hard and so on, but the right. ones with the little steel prongs and right, so right, on. Right, right, right. Yeah, we, we started that. We were the one that started that. As a matter of fact, I got the idea from a pimp. Okay. And it was a pimp that did it, and we had, at one time, we had the machines. We went to Sears and Roebuck and bought these different press machines and stuff, and taught people how to make the picks, and we were making the picks and so on, etc. Well, I was a pick user, so yeah, I want you to know that okay. I used to have hair. And we used to have a pick because <laughs> what happened is how I grew up. And then we also, in terms of the women, was going to a transition because we would take all of the perm and stuff out of the hair, would use vinegar and stuff, and all oh, the shop used to be like this. Okay. And the majority of our customers at one point in time were females. And we knew that something was really happening because they were the ones that was we're raising the it. kids and you know and okay. working behind the scenes in terms of a lot of things being happening and that's how all that we got kind of caught up in that maze. You made you you bring it to my to my attention when you say transition because I remember as a kid most of the blacks we were using the Murrays and we would have to slick back. Or you, you know, the finger went dyed and fried and swept to the side. <laughs> yes, all, all of that existed. And, and yes. then we transitioned to the, the the Afro or say it loud, James Brown. I'm black and, and I'm, proud. I'm proud. Right. Stokely and, Carmichael. Yeah. All. Yes. So that was worst thing could have happened was okay. James Brown came out with that record that I'm black and I'm proud. You said the, I'm what? saying James Brown significantly contributed to the conscious, the black consciousness. Um, he contributed, oh yes, he, he contributed, as a matter of fact, in this city, we were having the riots up and down Blue Hill Avenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They flew James Brown in town to the Boston Garden, and they came through with the megaphones and so on and said, James Brown is in town, even better. He's on television on Channel 2, and the people stop riding to go and see James Brown. That's how they stopped the That's ride. how they stopped the ride. Godfather of Soul. Good. 
Godfather, so. And we all grew and, up on there trying to imitate his And then dance. once he did, and when he did that, mm -hmm. when he did that in terms of talking about I'm black and I'm proud, and they began to make the transition, that's when they began to, if you go back and you will see, they began to change the laws and so on. Um, did you meet him at all in your travels, you and your dad? No. Okay. No. Any other luminaries that you mentioned, several, Malcolm, Malcolm X and... Bill Russell. Bill, Bill Russell, Russell was a pillar in this, 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 this community. Bill Russell would leave the Boston Garden, uh, the Jones brothers, uh, it's particularly Casey, yeah. Sam, Sam, Sam Jones. Jones. Not okay, so much so Casey. Casey Jones, okay. but Sam Jones. Uh, but Bill Russell was very, very active right, what about in the community. Uh, Satch was too, okay. but he came after. Yes, he after came Bill. later. Yes, because Bill was there in, in the fifties. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill Russell, right? He was started, in the fifties. Fifty-six, right. I believe. Right. But when he first came to the yeah, South. But he took a lot of heat as a result of him become very active on the issues that it was within the community itself. Yes. This is. I mean, I'm. I'm still just awestruck sitting here talking to you that. Your modesty and humility about the things that you've seen and done, your family. And so, once again, I'm going to come back to the question I raised earlier about if you can talk about the contributions or accomplishments of your family, even though there's much more to be done, because you just laid out a litany of things that you have done that uh, deserves credit and recognition. You know, I don't know. One time we were going to start a thing to try to get a place named after my dad, mm -hmm. and we had to question that, you know, if daddy would really like that or not. And we concluded that he didn't. Is that the kind of the strategy? Be involved, but be working behind the scenes? That's correct. Going back to that original premise. Right. Um, I had a responsibility working for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and um, I like to think I worked very hard at it. I was blessed with a good crew of people, um, that had to be there and some people that were working there. And it's as a result of these people that, that we were able to do some outstanding things. And sometimes I said, oh wow, it would be nice if they had a place that could have the alcoholic name on it. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know? And then I just divorced that. I won't leave that. And there's all reasons too, I think that uh, one of my other colleagues had such an outstanding record in the operation of a correctional facility that mm -hmm. the one that I had responsible for, responsibility for, uh, it would have been, as a matter of fact, they have done that, this man by the name of Charlie Gong, they named the institution after him. But uh, I kind of like, and I'm getting to your question, is. You know, look in terms of the, what the contributions. I, th I think it is the reason that my brother would sell property. I know I heard my brother's reason it last night, going and telling people why they should buy their property, why they should. And he's not talking about having it, and I want to sell it for you or I want to get it for you. He wasn't talking about that. He was saying that you go on and do it because if you own the land, and he was giving them something that a typical person that's in the business wouldn't do that too. Um, I have uh, my daughter is a school teacher as an example and uh, I asked her why does she want to do that and she said that she wants to make a difference and I said well why are you teaching where you're teaching and again she said she wants to make a difference and uh, when she first started and this is about her third year I would come home and here's this mail and on the back of the mail it says this letter is from a correctional institution mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So I said, and she gets, now, you know, why are you getting this? And she said, Dad is one of my students. And so she's, and she would write to the individual and she would go and she would visit mm -hmm. some of those individuals and stuff. And those are contributions and they're significant. So those individuals, when they come and she would go in, she would try to tell them how best they could do their time or so on, or how best that they could, or so on, or she would send them some schoolwork. Those are significant contributions because those same individuals now can see something a little different and go in a direction. So, so 
the contribution, I don't know. I don't know because we don't look at it that way it's in terms of that we are obligated to do things. We are obligated to help our brother. We are obligated to help our sister. We are obligated to stand up right. But you also have the opportunity, I think, to share with people your observations because it seems from my perspective that your family, as you call it, the barbershop and Nubi Notion at the heart and the center of our community. So if I think of the Elmer Lewis's, uh, the Muriel and Otto Snowden, uh, Melina Cass, um, Tom Atkins, and if I look at those personas that have graced these steps, these cobblestones in this town, and have made an impact, and then if I look at the current crop of African American leadership, would you give us your insights in terms of where we've been and where we are today? Yeah, well, you know, I, I wonder about that. I wonder about that. Um, I got Elma Lewis involved in our prison system. She did wonders for that. Mr. Snowden, the same thing. Mm -hmm. He did wonders with that. Um, the community was more compact then. What do you mean by that? Uh, let me try to put it a different way. I could walk out on this corner and I'd be on the corner for about three minutes and somebody would come by, hey Abu, you want to ride? Or I would know just about the, maybe other person that would go by in a car. Mm -hmm. I stand out there for hours now as if I'm a stranger within the, the community. Within the community. So, okay. And so the community has expanded uh, this car, that's part not of as the cohesive. Of the We're not as cohesive. Correct. And so back then the people had tools and people had a common thing in terms of their driven regardless of what your religious belief was. We got, it was just a common thing. We may have different in terms of the strategy that you may take. I'm going to become a member of the NAACP. Well, I'm going to be a D mm -hmm. Okay. But people realize that we are going to the same place, is that we have different ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so right now it just seems to be, in comparison, it just seems to be so fragmented. And, and the reason why is because it's so, it's, it's so broader. But, but, you know, you still see the effort. And again, uh, if I look at Mr. Obama, uh, Mr. Obama, it seems like to me he's getting that back. I can see that that happening. Again. So elements of the past are present in his embodiment of what he represents. That's good. But in terms of the African-American leadership here, is, do you see those elements being carried out or are we missing opportunities here? No, I see it being carried out. It's just that it's much more difficult now. It's much more challenging now. Internally or externally? I think a combination of both of them. Okay. I think it is a combination of both of them. Uh, uh, and, and I think that it is all, uh, uh, in part, I think that it's orchestrated as well. Uh, because at that, when I was talking about when the James Brown came out with I'm Black and I'm Proud and, and how just close it was when he says, uh, uh, he took cut off his process. Mm -hmm. I think the powers to be really take, took a look at that and says, oh, this was is like, Wasn't that in the summer of 68 when that song came I don't out? know exactly when. It was either 67 or 68. I don't know I exactly when, but when you also look, you look and see when the laws begin to change. Right. And when all of a sudden there was an expansion of prison and all of a sudden you see uh, a vast amount of African American males going to prison. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that was all part of the orchestration in terms. Yes, definitely. Raw material that needed to support a system That's as correct. a transition from a uh, manufacturing base to a service base. That's correct. That's correct. I think what we should uh, do at this point is uh, have Teddy and them. Um, kind of phase out for this segment and then we'll come back um, and, and revisit uh, some other questions. Okay. To Mike. You Go. know, Abu, we have been so blessed to be able to hear you share your family's legacy, um, the history, just the, the experiences that you've been talking about. 
And in looking at you, you have this very distinguished look. I see you playing golf. And we talk a lot more on the golf course. And, and there's a, an, an analogy if you were in the spring, the summer, and the fall, or the winter of one's life. So I say that you're somewhere between the, the, the fall and the winter. And that's where you know, a lot of things can happen. So if you were to take a look at where Boston has been, where it is lost some of its things, and now we're moving into another phase, what advice, what counsel, what type of insights would you share with the listeners about what we need to do to kind of recapture some of the essence of the what I call the folks in your generation who had class in spite of the obstacles they faced. You brought integrity to the process even though that everything didn't go your way. And so there's a level of things that we're missing. What advice would you share with us or give us insight and wisdom? Well, you know, Donnell, it's not necessarily Boston itself. Um, a part of, I talked about, my mom and dad didn't raise us by themselves. Okay. It was the next door neighbor too. It was the person that was around the corner. Um, and it took that, and it was not only uh, me and my kid, I mean, me and my uh, uh, sisters and brothers, but my mom and dad was mom and dad to the other kids in the community as well, as our okay. mom and dad was to us. And I think we kind of like lost that. We don't even know the people that live next door to us anymore and so on. Um, you think we're I ready mean, to recapture that? I think, I think that we, we must if we want to sustain because we're losing. I mean, we're losing our, I'd be losing our future mm -hmm. in terms of our kids. L let me say this. Um, uh, I, I really think there's no one solution. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the solution is to, uh, we have a captivated audience. they in a way under captivity. And it's the individuals that are in prison. And what bothers me is strong people, I'm not saying you, but strong people like you and and others are not going out to these institutions because it's a good opportunity to go in and to begin to teach these individuals, to begin to help them reestablish certain standards. Uh, a lot of people talk about being a father, but really don't know what a father is because they never had a dad. And I think that you know, we have to reach into our prison system. We have to reach and learn how to utilize them and see those individuals in terms of a resource of talking to the authorities here in the state and saying, look, let us take some of these guys to some of these schools and talk with these kids and talk with some of these game bangers to let them know in terms of what the real deal is. Um, we have to do some of these things because what is happening now is that we are manufacturing madness and it's coming back into this community and individuals can't find work. Even if their intentions are good, we almost put them in a compelling position to do otherwise and to give up hope. And uh, I think this is a fundamental uh, a need that need to be, uh, that should be addressed by a certainly, and I mean, when your your kid, you're not concerned about your kid doing something wrong these days. You're not concerned about that because you brought your kids up. There's certain principles and things about your kids. I, with mine, wasn't worried about them doing something. I was worried and concerned about somebody else doing something to them mm -hmm. that would do harm to them. And that's happening more and more every day, not only here in Boston, but also where I'm going. This, it is the same thing. But what we have to do as a people, because there's so many of us in this situation, and the guys are really uncomfortable with the, the fact that we are neglecting them. That's a very, very, very important that, the point that you're bringing out, that there, there is a captive audience that's willing to 
um, hear the insight and the wisdom. But tell me or share with us um, opportunities as you see it uh, going into the next quarter. What opportunities do we have? Mm -hmm. For you personally, for your family? Uh, well, well, for me, uh, I feel like I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a survivor. I always felt that I'm a survivor. Um, I don't necessarily sing out of the same hymn book, but when, when I was in, more directly involved with Nubian Ocean, it didn't operate it the same way. I became, it was Cahill Caprine that says, when you give of your possessions, you give little. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. And we had given a lot of money to appoint St. Joseph's School, named the library after us, some other school did this in. We were doing that, donating a lot of money, contributing a lot of money to schools. Um, I still feel that we wasn't, that, that wasn't enough. And that's how I became involved in prisons. Okay. And, and I think that, you know, we need to kind of like, you know, it's not just one answer, but in terms of something in which I find in terms of my comfort zone, I find in terms of what my wisdom see and from practical explosions, uh, 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 a potential uh, wealth. You know, it's, it's, what's the name of this company? WM Waste Management. Mm -hmm. They take your garbage and they do different things with it now and so on. They got Recycle. brand new trucks and, and the doggone guys that's doing the garbage now. They come out in uniform and shop and crisp and, you know, they do a good job, et cetera. We look at those guys as in our prison system as waste. But we have not gone over to them, right, in terms of how we can take in and utilize that. And we're letting them other, we're let, yes. And I think that we have to do that. That's one segment of that. And our school system has to change on the other side of that. So education is the common thread, whether it's in the prison or in the school That's or correct. in the community, in your places of worship. That's correct. There is a consciousness of education That's correct. and exposing or widening your aperture that you have been speaking about through. Yeah. So the whole notion is that, but who's responsible? Is it the parent? Is you. It the child? You. Okay. Because the way the situation is now, the head of households, the majority is by single family. So the kid that naturally doesn't have that balance. But we have to, I, you know, I hear, you know, I, there was an empty lot here for 20 years. I didn't own it. The city wouldn't let me have it. I got letters I could show you. I could try to, to get the property. They just wouldn't let me have it. But I cut that grass and stuff. What I did is used to, kids would come by and I would let them for the first time. They never wondered how a lawnmower worked. And to do that, and even today, now some of those kids are grown, they come by and they tell me, you know, hey, thank you. It's just a little thing mm -hmm. that you can do. And we're not doing that anymore. That's the hurting thing is that we're not doing that because we expect for someone else to do it. Yeah. And when you see, you know, when I go, we talk about the golf course. I go up there, I like it, I like the social thing, but I like to also talk some relevancy with the guys. I say, hey man, why don't we form something? Why don't we start going to these juvenile homes and part some of your wisdom, tell some of the stories to your kids and stuff. You're not interested. So we fail. With all our wisdom, with all our exposures, maybe it's because we think that we have a quiet and accumulated, and so therefore, maybe because, hey, I'm vintage, man, and I'm tired, and I have a comfort zone now. Well, do you think it's because when, in the 50s and 60s, the conditions for black people were so wretched that it didn't matter how much or what occupation you had, that you were going to be treated in the same horrible way. But then as time passed on, yeah. the uh, mobility of folks, uh, black middle class, um, athletes, entertainers now have really changed the landscape. We, because we have become... And we've moved out. We have become more fragmented. We have to divide and come. But see, when you're down, I'm down. Mm -hmm. That was you down and I, yeah, and it's but, still now. But 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 most people don't see it that way. 
then, the, then how do we get people to? I don't have that answer. Well, that's the, the that's I the know question. in terms of something. You know, I like to do something. When I used to talk with the prisoners, mm -hmm. I would talk to something that's achievable to them, not beyond their grasp. Okay. And then when they get there, then they can look further. Mm -hmm. And so is that this is something beyond our grasp. This is still something that is part of our responsibility. This is part of our responsibility. And it's such a significant force. That's why it doesn't make sense for a kid to go to the Boston Public School, including busing. We spend less than $6,000 a year to be safe, 7000 Take that kid's father and put him in prison. We spend up to $42,000 a year to keep him in prison. Disconnected from the child and the family. Not only that, from the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, not only that, in terms of we're not educating the child because we're putting less than $7,000 and walking to the school. Look, go and see what my, my daughter teaches and see what they have in, to, to for, for her students mm -hmm. in comparison to you going outside of the community and see what they have for the computers and so on, et cetera. You mean teaching. suburban schools or Definitely. other schools that have Definitely. a level of resources? Right. So and so we may not have the money to do that, but we 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 do have we do have we can we can have vans we should have uh, what do they call it a trail of cars uh, a fleet a, a, a fleet not a fleet okay. something not your own you got your own car someone's got their own car and you all put your pennies together or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts give you all so much money right that you can go out there and you begin to talk with those particular individuals give these guys in terms some kind of form of training the, the people that are out here. Right, that can't find work, some type of training, and get them into the prison to teach them in terms of skills and so on, etc. And I and I say prison because I was prison. in prison, and 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 the keepers know better than the kept. That's why I say I was in prison, and 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 give those individuals so that the bottom line. You know why I and my brother mm -hmm. and my, my sisters uh, 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 try so hard because. We believe in ourselves. You believe in you. Oh and a lot of folk have just given up that hope. They're just not there. We got young men that's out there, they see that destiny as being in prison or in, and I died young and make a beautiful course. Uh, the, the phraseology of live rich or get rich or die trying, yeah. that's the mentality. But let me just see if I can get you to sum up, if you can. You didn't want to talk about your family contributions, but you have. You didn't want to talk about working uh, on the front, but you have always been engaged. And now you have laid out a litany of things about what we can do. But if you had to sum up your mother's values, your father values, what you said you were saying, how would you describe you and your 10, uh, or your brothers and sisters in terms of how you would want people to remember you in this conversation or this segment? Uh, proud. Proud of what? Self. Okay. Self pride. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, family pride. Yeah, family. Yeah, sure. Bring. Um, um, yeah, our name is important. Our name is. Important. Our word is important as a family. I, I don't want to sound boastful. No, no, I'm not but, taking it that uh, way. And I don't think the yeah. folks listening would as well. Uh, yeah. But we were brought up in the heart of the inner city. Um, there were lures and so on. And there was someone over us with a watchful eye. I would use the I word commitment too. A commitment, definitely a commitment, a, a, a determination. Okay. But some of those things are developed. I mean, some of those things that they're not given, they develop, and and and, and we got we got help from not only mom and dad, but from our other mothers and fathers within the community. You you are dad to me, even though I'm older than you are. You are dad. When I see you, I know what you represent. 
I know what you're trying to do. And it's reflecting your family, what you are responsible for. I see it. I see it in terms of the individuals who approach me and tell me. But we need more people like that. Thank you and so much. we don't have as many. Okay. Thank you so much.